I've been busy mapping where weapons flow in this world, especially those that originate in the United States. And this is part two of a series on the arms trade. If you watched part one, you'll already know that there's a long history of businessmen getting rich off of war. But I wanted to see what the weapons trade looks like today, using data. So after months of working on this, we finally got a map that looks nice, it looks pretty. The thicker the lines, the more weapons flow. So in this video, I wanna go deep into these lines to show you what they can teach us about how the United States projects its power, about what happens when you sprinkle weapons all around the globe. I've been looking at every one of these countries, and with the help of my new colleague, Sam, I'm hoping to bring you in into a much deeper understanding of the American arms trade. I also wanna let you in on some of the conversations I've been having with experts in this field, which for me was very helpful in decoding all of this. Hello, hello. I'm Jeff Abramson. I'm a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy. And I also lead something called the Forum on the Arms Trade, which is really where my passion is. Uh, I'm Bill Hartung. I'm currently a senior research fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. I've been working on arms trade issues since the 90s. Why do we sell weapons to other countries in the first place? I mean, at the most basic level, it is to promote peace and security. When we talk about the currency of international relationships, sometimes weapons become that currency. And what we desperately need is alternate currencies. Well, there's the textbook reasons and real reasons. You know, the Pentagon would tell you it uh, promotes stability, it helps allies defend themselves. So there's this kind of strategic argument, but it's really about if you believe the U.S. should be able to go anywhere, fight any battle, beat any adversary. It's kind of premised in a fairly militarized view of foreign policy. The United States sold weapons to 103 countries, and that's major weapons. Generally, whenever the United States provides weapons to another country, they have to agree on how to use them, and they're not supposed to use them to violate human rights. But it's hard to see the leverage that the United States can use with that government. <laughs> One last thing I want to do before we dive fully in is give you a theoretical point in IR, international relations. Understanding this will help us understand this map much better. It's this concept of balance of power. The big paradox in international relations is that countries will naturally get into conflict with each other unless they calculate that it is unwise to do so, that they actually don't have a chance of winning or gaining anything. So countries are always building up their weapons so that they have just enough so that their enemy will not attack them but not too much to where they will provoke some kind of escalation and their enemy will start to get into a race to have more weapons. Every country is making this calculation all of the time, this balance of power with their rivals in their region. And weapons systems and capabilities tend to be the ingredients that are used for that calculation, for that balance of power. When the US government approves a bunch of weapons being sent to some country, in all of their press releases, they always say the same thing which is that this sale will not alter the balance of power in the region. An imbalance of power is what leads to escalating conflict and instability. What an irony that the promotion of peace and security is sell killing machines to other countries. <laughs> there are people who believe this creates better peace and security. At the moment of the transfer, it seems like a good idea. It feels like you've got to provide them, or like this is the only solution, is you put, put these weapons in this situation because we're out of options. The first takeaway from this is just what you can see immediately, that the United States has a massive presence all around the world. You could look at these lines as almost tentacles of US influence in almost every country on Earth, selling jets and guns and tanks and missiles and bombs and radar and helicopters in exchange for influence. I'd say at the real global level is this idea that if we are engaging in you in the arms trade, if you are buying weapons from us, we will have some say in how you act. But that's about all this map will show you. The US has influence all over the world. It's something we kind of know. I want to get a deeper understanding of what's going on with each of these lines, which is why I reached out to my good friend, Sam Ellis. Sam Ellis, creator of Search Party. Do you have time to help me out? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Sam specializes in taking something that's complicated and giving us a better insight into it, helping us learn from it using design and visual language. So Sam's down here and we're gonna figure out how to decode this map. 
There's a place that collects oh. all oh, yeah, of that's yeah. our guy. What we are trying to do here is we want to understand the why. Because this map doesn't say why. It doesn't say, like, what is the U.S.'s motive in this. It's often securing the loyalty of a regime somewhere. Yeah. And yeah. weapons are the currency for securing yeah. loyalty. The U.S. sometimes wants stability in the region. Mm -hmm. And it achieves that sometimes by wanting stability in terms of we picked you as a government. We would like you to stay in power. One of the reasons we sell is so that we don't have to be the world policemen everywhere all the time doing all the work. We can have people we basically outsource it to. You know, what I'd like this map system to somehow convey is that what the U.S. buys with the currency of weapons varies. And I think it would be really interesting to, to zoom in to some of these case studies and somehow show what the U.S. is buying. Yeah. So stability, it's... It's allies, an ally, stability, resources, relationship. And we put all the categories on, and then you zoom into the different combinations. Let's zoom into Saudi Arabia, they have all four. Why do they have all four? Let's go to Colombia, they have two. Why two? So when we zoom into these cases, we should be more descriptive and less analytical. It's so like, what do you think the map is gonna look like? Like, do you think that the, the most weapons are gonna go to the country with the most number of badges? Yes. At the end of the day, there is a deep underlying force in all of this, which is that the more weapons we sell, the more money they make. Yeah. And the so, people in this town want to make a shit ton of money. Okay, so the goal here is to take this map, which shows who the U.S. is selling weapons to, and add what they're asking for in return. But that's a lot easier said than done. Because the U.S. doesn't say exactly what it wants back for these countries in exchange for weapons, it's hard for us to make any definitive claims. But I think if we look at these countries' locations, their history, and their relationship with the U.S., we can surmise that the U.S. is asking for basically five main things. Stability, alliances, friendship, help against an enemy or a rival, and vital resources. So we looked at the more than 100 countries that the U.S. sells weapons to and tried to estimate what they could give the U.S. in return. And then we mapped it. So now we can see not only who the U.S. sells weapons to, but we have an idea of why. And although this is based on subjective estimations by us, it's still useful to see that American weapons come with expectations, namely that these countries will help the U.S. project its influence and its power all over the globe. So if we think of weapons as a currency, then the most common thing it's buying is friendship. Weapons are one of the most effective ways for the U.S. to get other governments on its side. And so it's a goal of almost every weapons deal. But some countries have more to offer than others. If we zoom to Europe, you'll see that the U.S. is also buying stronger allies. The U.S. is in the NATO alliance with most of these countries, so the U.S. sells them weapons as a way to make their defenses as strong as possible and to prepare them for the possibility that they may have to fight a war together. The U.S. considers many countries allies, but we only included countries that the U.S. is obligated to defend because it's signed a treaty. Ukraine is an example of a country that the U.S. sells lots of weapons to, but isn't in the NATO alliance. Instead, the U.S. is asking for Ukraine to counter an enemy. We've defined four countries as the main enemies or rivals of the U.S. The U.S. often sells weapons to their neighbors as a way to fight a war against them or deter them from starting a new one. Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014. And so the U.S. is selling Ukraine weapons, and in exchange, the U.S. is stopping Russia from conquering it and other countries in the region. In the Middle East, the U.S. sells weapons to a number of countries as a way to counter its other enemy, Iran. The primary example is Israel, who gets a huge number of weapons from the U.S. But the U.S. also sells weapons to countries that control vital resources that it needs. In the case of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, that's oil. But a vital resource can also mean a strategic passageway, like the Suez Canal in Egypt, where a lot of the world's shipping goes through. By selling them weapons, the U.S. is asking these countries to protect and give it access to these resources. In Africa, the U.S. sells weapons to many governments, not just to secure resources, but also to try and make them more stable. War and coups have made many regions in Africa volatile and unpredictable. And the U.S. hopes that by selling weapons to these governments, it can help them stay in power and maintain the status quo. It's important to understand that these labels often overlap, like in East Asia. China, a major U.S. rival, is pushing to assert its control over this region, and the U.S. is responding by selling weapons to countries standing in its way. Some are allies. 
Some control vital resources, like Taiwan's semiconductor industry. Then there are many that the U.S. feels it needs to strengthen so that China can't destabilize the region. So now we can see not only where these weapons flow, but why. The definitions are based on some subjective categories that we came up with, but even still, it's useful to see that American weapons come with expectations that these countries will help the U.S. project influence and power all over the globe. Okay, thank you, Sam. Man, I'm glad Sam came into this story. He is the master of taking complex systems and breaking them down to get a deeper understanding of really rich data. Search Party is the channel I started with Sam um, last year, and it is awesome. It is similar to what we do here, but with a very different journalistic approach. You should go subscribe because it's really good stuff. So for the final chapter of this video, I'm going to address something that many of you familiar with the arms trade are maybe thinking about right now, which is, does all of this actually work? If weapons are a currency for influence and the US is using that currency to buy stuff, to buy influence or stability around the world, does that actually work the way that the Pentagon and the United States government think it does? The short answer is, Sometimes, but not really. Where weapons really do work is in keeping alliances strong. There's no question some countries welcome it. You know, I realize like Korea and Japan and so forth, Australia. And it probably does cement those relationships, make it more likely they'll support the U.S. in, in a crunch. But when it comes to trying to use weapons as an incentive to get countries to behave the way you want them to, that's where it kind of starts to break down. And the best case for this is Saudi Arabia. You can see on this map, we give a lot of weapons to Saudi Arabia. The Obama administration approved loads of weapons transfers to Saudi Arabia. And in doing so, we had some strings attached. A big one being that those weapons could not be used to violate human rights or from the horse's mouth, genocide, crimes against humanity, grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions, serious violations of common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, attacks directed against civilians who are legally protected from attacks or other war crimes as defined by 18 U.S.C. 2441. Translation, Saudi Arabia is not to use these weapons against civilians in any of their conflicts. And yet, as Saudi Arabia has been waging this war against Yemen, They've done exactly that, using American weapons. They've bombed hospitals, weddings, and even a school bus. And we know that this is American weapons because investigators and journalists have looked at the wreckage of these attacks and looked at the actual serial numbers, concluding that these are American weapons, that they flow through these lines. Although Saudi Arabia was bombs, most people in Yemen viewed it as an American war. Sent arms to Saudi Arabia, that slaughter people in Yemen, but there was sort of this notion that, well, they're an oil supplier, they're a bulwark against Iran, and those so-called larger strategic interests um, overrode the um, human rights imperatives. Shout out to Bellingcat, the open source investigative journalism project that like helped uncover a lot of this stuff. So Saudi Arabia isn't obeying the conditions that we put on these weapons. And Congress tried to pass a resolution that said that they were going to cut off some of this military aid that we were giving to Saudi Arabia. The problem is a lot of the power to approve these weapon sales rests with the executive, the president. So President Trump actually vetoed this resolution. And even under the Biden administration, even though there was like a brief pause, the weapons have kept flowing making it very clear that this leverage that the U.S. thinks it has because it's the provider of all of these weapons is actually kind of reversed. Turns out Saudi Arabia has a lot more leverage than we thought. You know, the idea is that the United States has kind of captured Saudi Arabia by having this weapons and defense arrangement, that the Saudis need to rely on us. They will do things that we ask them to do. Or I think the opposite is now happening. That Saudi Arabia has been able to turn the tides and say, hey, if you don't provide this, we'll find an alternate partner. The relationship has been perverted. Okay, but Saudi Arabia is a monarchy. Maybe we have better luck influencing fellow democracies. So let's look at Israel, who receives more military aid from the United States than any other country. I think Israel is the prime example of the lack of leverage that you would think a well-developed long-term weapons relationship would have. The U.S. government has come out and said that they are not happy with the way that Israel is conducting its war against Hamas in the Gaza Strip. 
And yet, what we see here is an effort to push more military aid to Israel, without any pause or withdrawal of these weapons transfers. And that's the reality of the arms trade, is that we can hope countries will take things into mind, we can tell them we want to do things, but ultimately they end up making local decisions for their local needs. There's a lot more cases just like this. Like the Philippines, where the Duterte regime has used American weapons to carry out a brutal war on drugs, murdering and jailing civilians in the process. What's confusing about this is that, in some sense, the weapons are working for U.S. interests. We sell them these weapons, we give them these weapons, we buy their support in deterring our enemy. But in the process, these weapons that we use as our currency are used for other things that have nothing to do with deterring our enemy. And sometimes it gets really out of control. Like, we give a lot of weapons to Turkey, a NATO ally. Turkey will then transfer that to its proxies in Syria who will use them to fight against American-backed rebels that are also using US weapons. So American weapons are being used on both sides of a conflict. It just feels a little bit like deja vu from the book that was written 100 years ago, stating that this was a problem and it still kind of is. The other big issue with using weapons as your main currency for influence around the world is that weapons don't just go away. Back in the 80s, the CIA transferred a bunch of weapons to rebel fighters in Afghanistan who were fighting against the Soviets. Decades later, those same weapons were being used by those fighters and their descendants to fight against Americans who were then invading Afghanistan. Same thing happened in Libya. We gave a bunch of weapons there and they leaked out and ended up in the hands of militants and insurgents in Syria and South Sudan. So if weapons are this currency that don't actually give us leverage and that can create more danger than stability, why do we keep making them and sending them to over a hundred countries? There's a lot of answers to that question, but one of them has to do with money. There's a lot of money in making weapons. There always has been since the Industrial Revolution. Lots of these weapons are made all over our country, intentionally creating a network of jobs that no congressman ever wants to vote down. If a congressman votes to make fewer weapons, they could be voting against a factory or production facility in their district. Add to that that some of our lawmakers own shares in these companies. If these companies make money, they make money. And yet they're the ones approving the money that goes to these corporations. A massive conflict of interest that we've reported on before in a previous video on insider trading. What you get is this military industrial complex, a permanent economic business machine that is incentivized to make more and more weapons, both to prepare for war and provide national security, but also to keep people rich and to keep the constituents of lawmakers happy. So in short, one of the reasons the map looks like this is to keep a bunch of private corporations nice and rich. Okay, well, that is the end of a journey for now. It started with an old book that really piqued my interest and brought me into a history that I didn't know about. And through this process, I feel like I've been able to draw a linkage between this history and how it works today, how for-profit corporations are still motivated to expand their business by making more and more killing machines. Now, weapons are a stabilizing force in our world. That is true, and that is an irony of stability in the world. You have to have weapons to have some kind of stability for now. Weapons also are political leverage that the US uses to keep the world somewhat stable. And yet, there's a lot to scrutinize and critique about the way that it's done. We're dealing with weapons. This is dangerous stuff. We should be able to properly criticize it and critique it. But instead, our ability to do that is hindered by the conflict of interest and the incentives that are brought on by these for-profit corporations and their relationship to our lawmakers. To me, this is what's wrong about the system. It perverts our ability to actually look into it, to actually scrutinize it properly, and to actually make the best decision for the safety and stability of our world. The weapons industry got out of control in the early 1900s and ended up contributing to 
the worst devastation the world had ever seen, which woke us up to actually being able to criticize this and trying to change it. A lot of those same conflicts of interest that keep war permanent and enriching still exist today. And my hope is that it doesn't take another devastating conflict for us to wake up. Covering war and conflict is something I'm not going to stop doing. I think it's really important for us to understand these issues so that we can critique them and question them. But as a journalist and YouTuber, it's hard for me to support this work. Not a lot of brands want to sponsor videos about guns and war. That's why I'm grateful that I'm a part of Nebula, which is a creator-owned and operated streaming platform. Nebula is kind of like YouTube, but instead of paying by watching tons of ads and selling your data, you contribute a small amount every month that goes directly to support creators. This is why on Nebula, you just see a lot of really high quality stuff, including Nebula Originals, which are series that you can't find anywhere else. Like one of my favorite Nebula Originals is Modern Conflicts, which is this map series by Real Life Lore. It dives into the geopolitics, the strategies, the tactics, the issues surrounding modern day wars and conflicts. Real-Time History's Red Atoms, all about the Soviet nuclear program. Wendover Productions has a fantastic series on logistics. Again, this is stuff you can't get anywhere else. All of these creators like me also put up their videos that are here on YouTube, but they're just there ad-free. I'm grateful to be a part of Nebula's community, and I'm grateful for those who have signed up for Nebula using my link, which again, directly supports the work we're doing here. Okay, so if you wanna check this out, there's a link in my description where you can get a discount. It is nebula.tv slash Johnny Harris. It's $2.50 a month if you do the annual thing, and it's five bucks a month if you do the monthly thing. You can cancel anytime. They also have a lifetime membership, which is by far the best deal if you plan to watch this kind of content for a long time. You'll get access to Nebula for as long as you and the platform are alive. Doing the lifetime thing is also a direct contribution to getting more Nebula originals sooner from us creators. We're building something special over on Nebula and I hope you will join us and support us so we can keep doing independent quality journalism here on the internet. Thank you all for watching this video. It was a deep dive, these two parts. If you haven't watched part one, we'll put the link in the description. You can go watch it. It's more on the history. And um, I'm grateful to Search Party for helping out here. Search Party is a fantastic new journalistic brand that we started here with Sam Ellis. A lot of people worked on this video to make it come to life. So thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next one.